Genesis 6, verse 1. It came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. So we've got here described two groups of people in verse 2. The sons of God on one hand and the daughters of men on the other hand. So in verse 2, who or what are the sons of men? It's an interesting thing to think about. Um, if we go to the literature, the different commentators, or even just to Google and type in Genesis 6, sons of God, you'll see all sorts of different ideas about who or what these uh, beings are. Here's a, a picture of, of one example. Um, angels, fallen angels. Somehow the sons of God are fallen angels here in Genesis chapter 6. And if we start to look for the evidence behind that assertion, um, you'll see that there is some evidence. Have a look in verse 2. If your Bible has a, a margin with a cross-reference, next to verse 2, where it says, the sons of God, you might read Job 1 verse 6 and Job 2 verse 1. Does anyone see that in their Bibles? Yes? Some of you do. Some of you might not have margins. Okay, so let's turn to those quotes and see what the evidence really says. Keep a marker in Genesis chapter 6. Let's come to, to Job chapter 1 and see what's recorded. Job chapter 1, verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So there's the phrase, the sons of God present themselves before the Lord. Now, we know that people can't see God, and the angels can, and the angels are constantly presenting themselves before God. So that's a reasonable conclusion to draw. Now, let's come to Job chapter 2, verse 1, and we can see that again this phrase is used. Job 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. So it's the very same picture, isn't it? We've got God and we've got the sons of God presenting themselves before him. Perhaps they are angels. Now, there's another quote up there, Job 38. If you'll turn to this one. And I think this quote very clearly shows that this phrase, the sons of God, can refer to angels. It's really just hinted at it in Job 1 and 2, but this quote in Job 38 is quite clear. Job 38 is God speaking to Job about the creation. And he's describing these wonderful things that happen, and he's saying to Job, you weren't actually there when this happened. Have a look in verse 7. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, were you there, Job? And the answer is no, he wasn't, because no one was there when the world was created by God. No one except the angels. So Job 38 verse 7 is this phrase, the sons of God, and it refers to the angels. So what we've seen so far is three passages in the Bible where this phrase, the sons of God, can refer to angels. If we look up the, the Hebrew phrase for the sons of God, they are the only examples in Scripture. 
So I've looked at all of them. So that's an interesting set of examples. Now, let's come back to Genesis chapter 6. And let's think for a moment about this passage, but let's also think about the method we should be using to interpret any passage of Scripture when we might want to know what it means. So if we look at chapter 6, verse 2, we found this phrase, the sons of God. We don't quite know what it means. We've gone to the margin. There's two examples there. There's actually three examples where the phrase is used. And we've looked up three different examples of where the phrase has been used. That's, that's an important thing to do. But it's not the only thing we should be doing. Cross-references are good, but it's very important to look at all the examples in Scripture before we draw a conclusion. So far we've looked at three examples, all in the book of Job. So what about outside the book of Job? In the Old Testament, there are no other examples. If we come to the New Testament, there's a whole series of other examples of this phrase. Let's come to Luke chapter 3. This is an important passage. Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3 is a very long, detailed genealogy. And of course, it's in the New Testament, so it's written in Greek, not Hebrew. But if we look at Genesis chapter 6 in a Greek translation, we'll see some common phrases and words that we find here in Luke chapter 3. The genealogy starts in verse 23, and this is what it says. Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli, which was the son of Mathat, and so on and so forth, right down to verse 38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So now we've got another son of God. And Adam is definitely not an angel. He's a man. So this same phrase can also be used to describe people. There's one counter example. Now, let's quickly look up a series of other examples, and then we'll come back to Genesis chapter 6, and we'll try and tie this all together. Let's come firstly to 1 John chapter 3. First of John 3. describes another group of people, definitely not angels, people who can be described as the sons of God. 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So here we've got John speaking to a group of believers in the first century, and he says, right now you are the sons of God, and in the future your bodies will be transformed. So believers, people, not angels, can be the sons of God. Now, come back to Philippians chapter 2. There's another example here. Philippians chapter 2, let's read verse 14 and 15. So we've got another writer writing to a different group of people in a different letter, in a different context. And he has a very similar thing to say. Philippians 2, 
verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So Paul says, if you behave honestly and shine out the light of Christ, you are a son of God. Of God. He's speaking to people. He's speaking to believers. Let's come to one last quote in, in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 14, which says this For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So the Spirit of God is God's word, the way He thinks. If our minds are directed by God's mind, then Paul says to another group of believers, you are the sons of God. So, what's Genesis 6 talking about? Well, it could be angels, because sometimes that phrase refers to angels. But, that phrase also refers to people on different occasions. People who have a very specific mindset which is directed by God. They're led by the Spirit of God. So there's lots of examples about how this phrase can be used. And the examples are quite different. And that's often what we see in Scripture. If we look up the cross-reference, we'll find lots of examples of the way in which a word or a phrase is used, and they're very, very different. And we can't necessarily pluck out one example and use that to assert what a specific case is talking about. We need to move away from examples, and we need to look for principles talking about the same topic, because a principle applies in all of the cases. And I think... There's another quote that's helpful in this context. Now, let's come to Matthew 22. Matthew 22 doesn't use the phrase, the sons of God. It's not an example. But what Matthew 22 does is talk about angels generally, and it gives us some principles around who and what angels are. So let's have a look here in Matthew 22, and let's look in verse 29. Jesus speaking to the Sadducees. Verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Now that's an important principle about angels because it tells us here in verse 30 that angels don't marry. Now, if we come back to Genesis chapter 6, that's very, very helpful in understanding verse 2. Have a look at verse 2, Genesis chapter 6. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. So the sons of God are marrying. So this phrase, the sons of God, can refer to angels, it can refer to people, but we know this principle, angels don't marry. So in Genesis 6, verse 2, it must be talking about people. So I spent a little bit of time looking at that. I think that's a really important thing to keep in our heads. Cross-references are very, very helpful, but if your margin just has one or two examples, that can lead us in the wrong direction. We need to look at all of the examples and then very carefully apply the principle 
to select the right example to support the scriptural argument. So perhaps here, next to Genesis 6, verse 2, we can write that the sons of God refers to a group of people who are led by the Spirit of God. Romans 8, verse 14. They behave in a particular way. Philippians 2, verse 15. And they are definitely not angels. Matthew 22, verse 29 to 30. And I think if we were to read that note in our margins, if we were reading the Bible for the very first time, that would be a helpful guide in the way we read this story in Genesis chapter 6. So now we've got two groups of people with two different mindsets, and you can see that we're back to the golden thread. The golden thread of Genesis 3 and Genesis 4 is now alive and well in Genesis chapter 6. A group of people directed by the Spirit of God, and you can see an example in verse 9, and the exemplar is Noah. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. That phrase is very similar to to Romans chapter 8. Those who are directed by the Spirit of God, that's what Noah was like. He, He asked God where he should go. He asked God what he should do. And that's what made him a son of God. But on the other side of the coin, we have the daughters of men, back in verse 2. And they're described as as marrying the sons of God, in verse 2. But have a look at the product of these marriages, verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. It talks about pride and ambition and power. That's what these people were like. You can think about Cain, a man of pride and ambition and power, just like these people here in verse 4. If we come down to verse 11, there's more description of these people. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Corruption and violence characterised these people. Now, that is repeated a couple of times in this chapter, but let's just for a moment turn to Matthew 24, because we can read some more about what these people were like. It's more than just corruption and violence. Matthew 24. Let's have a look in verse... 37. Matthew 24, verse 37. As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So there, in verse 39, we can read that these people are completely ignorant of God's plan. They did not know the flood was coming. They did not know there was an ark to save them. They just didn't know at all. They don't know about God. And as a consequence, verse 38 describes them. It's a completely materialistic life. Eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, corruption, violence, pride, all the other things that we've seen. So I think you'd agree, this is a very accurate description of the seed of the serpent now seen in a whole 